Father, aware that we are um, tackling some uh, concepts and issues around the person of Christ this morning that maybe we're not used to thinking about all that often. Father, we pray that you'll give us capacity to be able to hear uh, what is being said. Help us to have capacity to understand it. And Father, we do pray that as a result of what we hear this morning, uh, that you might help us both to trust Christ more um, and by your spirit, may you make us more like him. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, so um, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21 says this. Look at this. It's on the screen. Uh, for you are called to this because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. Um, 1 Peter 2, keep it up there actually. Uh, people at home would much rather look at that than my face. Uh, isn't that deeply unfair? Okay, look, look at what we're being called to. Um, Christ suffered for you. He left, he left you as an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. What is Peter telling you if you're a follower of Jesus to do? You're to follow in Jesus' example and you're to commit no sin. Uh, in suffering, no deceit is to be found in your mouth as you follow his example. Now, um, uh, if you're new here to Surrey Chapel, you've, you've got to understand this. Um, first and foremost, a Christian is someone who is saved by Jesus. Not saved because they've lived a perfect life and, and not sinned at all, but saved because of his perfect life his saving death and if you're a christian person here this morning if you're trusting in christ let me assure you you are forgiven you are loved in christ you are secure that is all true but as someone who is loved and forgiven and secure peter says you need to follow jesus example and isn't that deeply unfair because isn't Jesus God? I mean, the answer to that is yes. How, like when Jesus was, Jesus is God, he walked this planet, of course he was sinless. He's God. God can't sin. This is massively unfair, isn't it? Why is Jesus being held as an example when it, it would be impossible to follow in those footsteps. You know, just think about it. When Jesus' little brother stole his toys, he never grabbed it back and smashed them on the head with it. Uh, when someone else took credit for Jesus' work, he never lashed out in pride or held a grudge. You know, when the cake was cut into pieces, he was never the one who was looking on and thinking, I'm going to manufacture this so I get the biggest piece. Never in his thoughts, never in his words, never in his actions. He never sins. How do we follow that? You know, it's a bit like, um, imagine you, you were told to follow the example of a billionaire. Um, do what a billionaire does. And um, here's what a billionaire does. Uh, they go on a ho these sort of holidays. There's um, Branson's Necker Island. Uh, they go on these sorts of flights. There they are, there's Branson flying into space. Uh, they go and meet these sorts of people. Uh, there's David Beckham, I imagine it's probably Wimbledon final, something like that. Um, go and do what he does. Can you just go and do what he does? Can you go and do what he does? No, you can't do what he does, because you're not a billionaire. And if you are a billionaire, you're really welcome. Um, and um, if you start tithing, it would really help the gospel ministry here. So if you're at home and maybe that's you, and look, please get in touch. Uh, of course you can't do what Richard Branson does because you don't have those resources. And here we have 1 Peter 2. Jesus says, follow my example, don't sin. And you think, well, how can I follow in his footsteps if I don't have his resources? It's impossible. Surely it's impossible. Well, um, today we have got a one-off talk. 
So um, we're starting a new series next week in the book of John. Uh, we finished last week in the book of 1 Samuel. And um, generally, if you're here, we tend to work through books of the Bible. Um, it's called expositional preaching, where we just we let God set the agenda, and we give him the microphone, and we just deal with the next passage, and we see what God is saying in those passages. Today, we're having a one-off, um, slightly doc- more doctrinal talk and my reflection from the first service is that it is a bit of a brain bender, okay? So I hope um, you've got your seats buckled in and um, you've had a lot of coffee to drink, right? Um, because we're going to think a little bit about the humanity of Christ this morning. Um, there's this book by Bruce Ware. Um, it's called um, The Man, Christ Jesus, uh, Theological Reflections on the Humanity of Christ. There it is. Can you see that? Oh, it's zoomed, very good zooming in. Uh, look at the book. There we go. Much better. You can't see my face there. Good. Okay. Um, uh, which, which have been very helpful for me as I've been thinking about this. And I think there are um, three things that we need to get into place as we think about what it means to follow Jesus as our example or why that's not a completely unfair thing for God to call us to do. And the first thing is to understand something about the person of Jesus Christ, who he is. And Jesus Christ is the God-man. He's the God-man. Now, um, if you've spent any time um, reading the New Testament and reading the Gospel accounts, you'll realise Jesus really is a man. Uh, He gets tired and he falls asleep on boats. Um, He gets hungry and he needs food to eat and water to drink. Um, He's got legs and he has to walk around. He really is. He was born of Mary. He was a baby and he grew and he grew and grew. Jesus really was a man. And yet he also did things that only God could do. Calm a storm. Uh, raise a leper, or actually heal a leper, raise the dead. And um, in the first few hundred years, um, after Jesus' death and resurrection, people argued over um, exactly who is the Lord Jesus? What are we looking at as we look at him? And um, they came to this formulation that Jesus really is the God-man. Now I'm going to stick a bit from Philippians chapter 2 verses 6 to 8 and um, let me read it to you this is this is this probably would have been an early hymn it was in uh, Paul's letter to the Philippians and this is what this is how they describe Jesus Jesus who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage rather he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Now look, what does this tell us about the person of Jesus Christ? Well, it tells us that Jesus is 100% God. See, look what it says. Who being in very nature God. Or it could be translated in the form of of God. How is he described? He doesn't consider equality with God. So he is equal with God. When you meet Jesus, you are meeting someone who is 100% God. Right? But also Jesus empties himself and takes on verse 7. He makes himself nothing and takes the very nature or the very form of a servant being found in human likeness. So he's saying this, Jesus is completely God and completely man. He is both at the same time. So let me tell you what that means he isn't, right? Um, It's not that Jesus is 50% God and 50% man. So he's a little bit of man and a little bit of God combined in one person. Um, So um, if that was right, what you'd have in Jesus is a totally different type of being Uh, you'd have a hybrid third type of being I told you this was going to be um, uh, you'd have to concentrate right 
He's not that. He's not 50% man. He's not 50% God. Um, he's not uh, 90% man and 10% God. Some people say, well, look, you know, he has uh, human form. He's absolutely human, but his mind is God. Um, if you like, uh, his brain is God, but the rest of him is humanity. That's not right. See, what we are dealing with Jesus is someone who is 100% divine and 100% human, united in one person. So um, the Council of Chalcedon, they, they kind of articulated, this is back in 451 AD, and they ironed this out, and just, just, just hang on in there for this moment. Let me just read this to you. Uh, one and the same Christ, Son, Lord, only begotten to be acknowledged in two natures, 100% God, 100% man, inconfusedly, wow, is that a word? Well, it, like I copied and pasted it, so it must be. Um, unchangeably, indivisibly, inseparably. Okay, so complete two natures, but they are completely united. And see that red concurring in the one person of Jesus Christ. So as you look at Jesus, you're looking at someone who is 100% God, doesn't stop being 100% God. At the same time, he's 100% man. He's 100% like you and me. So he gets hungry. And Mary had to change his nappy. And when he fell over, he bled. Because he really did take on our flesh. 100% man. 100% God. Philippians 2, really, it says he possesses the very of nature of God, but he doesn't express it because actually in his humility, he really became like one of us. See, as we come to follow Jesus' example, we're following the example of the God-man. But what we need to understand about Jesus, the God-man, is that actually as he lived... He lived in the power of the Spirit. Okay? He lives in the power of the Spirit. This is the second point. Are you still with me or is your brain frazzled? Some people are nodding. Other people are saying, what time is the rugby starting? Come back, right? Here we go. Let's go like this. So listen to this. Acts 10 verse 38. Okay, listen to what Peter says. I'm going to try and persuade you of this. See whether you think this is what Scripture teaches. Acts 10 verse 38. Peter is preaching a sermon to non-Jews about Jesus. And look at what he says. Uh, he talks about Jesus, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and he went around doing good, healing um, uh, all who were under the power of the devil, because God was with him. So what is Peter saying here about Jesus? How does he do good? How does he do some powerfully supernatural acts? It's in the power of the Spirit. Now, um, it's weird, isn't it? Can't he have said, Peter could have said, um, Jesus is God become one of us, and he did all these wonderful acts because of his divine nature. Because he is God. But he doesn't. He says he does it in the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, let's be clear. Peter really thinks Jesus is God come down. He calls him my Lord and Savior. He uses terms for Jesus that he would only use for God. And yet he attributes some of his life and actions to the work of the Holy Spirit. Now, why is that? Jesus says it as well. Uh, Matthew 12, 28, Jesus cast out demons. And the, the, the Pharisees are saying, Jesus, the reason you're casting out demons is because you are one with the devil. And he says, don't be potty. I'm not one with the devil, but look how Jesus describes what he does. Matthew 12, 28. Uh, but if it is by the Spirit of God that I drive out demons, uh, the kingdom of God has come upon you. You know, how is Jesus saying he's doing this? He doesn't say if it's by the divine nature that I drive out demons. He says it's by the Spirit of God. Now, why does Jesus and Peter both say Jesus in his day-to-day -day ministry does these works through the Spirit of God? Now, just, just try and concentrate at this moment, okay? Jesus is fully God. Nothing can be added to him. He's infinitely and eternally God. He's perfectly God. Um, what can the Spirit contribute to Jesus' deity? 
He's 100% Godness. Nothing. Because he's 100% God. But what can the Spirit contribute to Jesus' humanity, his 100% humanity? Well, it's everything. It's everything. Everything that in his human nature he would lack. See, for Jesus to be able to experience life as we experience it, Jesus fundamentally lived as a man. He wasn't leaning on the infinite resources of his divine nature, but he leant on the power and enabling of the Holy Spirit. For him to live a godly life, and a wise life, and a brave life, and a moment by moment, day by day, to fulfill the mission his, he was sent to accomplish by his Father, he relied on the enabling and power of the Holy Spirit. And I think two quotes from the Old Testament help highlight this and help us to understand what that actually means and what that looks like. And the first scripture is this from the Old Testament, Isaiah 11, 1 to 3. You're going to see it up on the screen. Okay, Isaiah 11. This is written about 700 years before Jesus was born. And look at, look at what it describes about this king who's going to come. Look what it says. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse, from the roots a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the spirit of counsel and of might, the spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord. He will delight in the fear of the Lord. So um, look at this. Um, the, uh, the Pharisees try to catch out Jesus and he answers wisely. Um, Jesus watches their reactions and he knows what's going on in their hearts. Uh, as he opens the scripture, people marvel at his teaching. As he meets the Samaritan woman, he has incredible insight. Where does Isaiah 11 verse 2 say all this insight is from? Where does it say it's from? The Spirit of the Lord that will rest on him. The Spirit of wisdom and this reservoir of wisdom and understanding, it's an outflow of of the Spirit resting on him. Uh, the power and counsel, uh, the counsel of might, his ability to devise a plan of action and follow it through. See, what is Isaiah 11 saying about this anointed king is that the Spirit of God will work in him to give him wisdom and character. Now that's, just thinking about Jesus, that's not going to be adding to his divine nature. Because you can't add anything to Jesus' divine nature, but in his human nature, it enables him to grow and understand. And Just flick on to Luke chapter 4. I want you to open this in your Bibles, the reading that we had read to us. Um, open it back up. If you've shut your Bibles, um, Luke chapter 4, it's on page 1031. 1031. I'll just give you a chance to pick that up. 1031. Uh, Luke chapter 4. Oh, there we go. Sorry, I've just chucked, stuck my mic on off mute. So there we go. I'm sorry about that, guys at the back. Luke chapter 4. And um, look at this. Um, we had this read to us. Luke chapter 4, verse 14. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through the whole countryside. He was teaching in their synagogues every day everyone every and everyone praised him so here is jesus he's come back from being tempted by satan in the desert and he's empowered by the spirit and what does he do verse 15 he preaches he teaches and he preaches and one of his sermons are highlighted here just have a look at verse 16 and 17 he went to nazareth where he had been brought up and on the sabbath day he went into the synagogue as it was his custom he stood up to read and the scroll of the prophet isaiah was handed to him and unrolling it he found the place where it is written and it's interesting at this point he doesn't turn to isaiah 53 the suffering servant, the, uh, the lamb that is slain. Uh, that's where I'd expect him to go. No, he goes to Isaiah 61. Listen to Isaiah 61. The spirit of the Lord is on me 
because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to uh, proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, set the oppressed free to proclaim the year of the Lord's um, favor. What is he saying here? He says the spirit anointed Messiah, ha- the spirit is enabling him to do what? To proclaim the gospel. If you like, um, uh, the Isaiah 11 passage, the Spirit enables him internally, wisdom and growth in that. Um, this Isaiah 61 passage, um, the Spirit enables, empowers him for ministry, for proclamation of the gospel. See, as Jesus starts out his ministry here, we are seeing him as the God-man. In his humanity, genuinely depending on the Holy Spirit to enable him for his life, to enable him to live the life he's called to be. You know, if we just stop and think about that for a moment, how amazing is Jesus? How amazing is Jesus? You know, he really could have lived his life through his divine nature. He had all the infinite resources, but he didn't. He lived in dependence on the Spirit. You see, when Jesus stopped and prayed, it's because he needed his Father's and the Spirit's help to get him through whatever was coming at him that day. Whatever was happening in that particular moment, he needed his Father's help. He could have leaned on his divine resources and yet in his humanity he leaned on his father and the spirit you see in that sense jesus really can be an example for us to follow see as that point put up there he really does call us therefore to live on independence on the spirit and what does it mean for us to live in dependence on the spirit if you're a christian person here today when you become a christian you are given the spirit in all his fullness what does it mean for us to depend on the spirit and let me give you one example from jesus life okay in the battles you face And the things that you are facing in front of you right now, and you think, I just don't know how to go into this and not sin. I just don't know how to go into this and survive. What is the example Jesus holds us? What does it look like for him to be dependent on the Spirit? He is dependent on Scripture. Now, I know you're going to be like, come on, Andy, really? Depending on the Spirit? Now you're talking about the Bible again? So sorry, chapel. But just look. Look at Jesus, okay? Um, So um, Luke 2, you can just flip back a few pages. Luke 2. Look what we learn about Jesus. Luke 2, verse 52. Uh, We're told here, Jesus, as he grows up, um, there's an incident of him as a 12-year-old, just a few verses before. And he grows in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Jesus, in his humanity, he matures. And he grows in wisdom. But what is that in the context of? Just have a look at verse 46. After three days, there's a story of Jesus. He's at the temple. And what is Jesus doing at the temple? After three days, they found him in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Uh, Why is he asking them questions? Because he wants to grow in knowledge and understanding. See, that's not in his divinity, but in his humanity, he grows. And what enables him to grow, it's the scriptures. It's God's word. You know, why do you think Jesus quotes Isaiah an awful lot? And he really does. Why do you think Jesus quotes Isaiah an awful lot? Because he read it. (laughs) He read it an awful lot. Why do you think in chapter 4, when he is tempted by Satan, that again and again and again, just have a look at chapter 4, 4 verse 4, Satan tempts him, 
Verse 3, if you really are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone. Verse 8, tempted, Satan tempts him again. What does Jesus say? It is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Satan tempts him again. Verse 10, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to God. That he you know, quotes an obscure psalm. Why does Jesus quote scripture at Satan in the moment he is tempted? Because he read it and he committed it to his heart. And the Spirit took those words and gave him strength to fight and battle and stand. It's good. Um, I'm sorry, I really, I, it's, a, it's a good ringtone. <laughs> thank you, that's good. That's good, that's, um, thank you, good. Right, we're back in, we're in Luke chapter four. All right, well done, we're there. Um, the point is this, how did the Spirit enable Jesus to grow wise? How did it grow him in wisdom as, how did the Spirit grow him in wisdom as he, as he read the scripture, how did he resist temptation as the scripture came with the power of God? How did he walk in godliness as the spirit of God enabled him to obey? Um, so he's not like this billionaire. Jesus is not like a billionaire saying, come on, follow me, but you don't have the resources I've got. You're on your own, so good luck. No, um, Jesus is the billionaire who um, says, actually, I'm going to live as a pauper. I'm going to live in the way that you all have to live. And I'm going to show you how to get up to, how to change, how this is going to work. And the billionaire saying, okay, why don't you invest in this fund and why don't you do this and why don't you try expressing this business? Jesus, with all his divine resources, lives in dependence and reliance on the Spirit, reading the Scriptures, and he says, follow my example. Um, uh, a, few, a couple of years ago, I was meeting up with my accountability group. I, there's a bunch of guys um, who I meet, I've been meeting with for almost 20 years. We're all in ministry in different areas of the country. And I was talking about a sin um, that I was really struggling with. And uh, they said to me, oh, Andy, that's one of your besetting sins. Do you know what a besetting sin is? It's one of your default sins. It's one of the things you just, you're weak and you just keep going back to again and again. And I'll be honest with you, I'd never clocked that it was one of my default sins. And I'm not going to tell you what it is, although you'd like to know. Uh, I'm not going to tell you what it is. But I wonder, what is one of your besetting sins? What are some of the, the patterns that you go into when you are weak and you think, do you know what? I just keep falling into that. You know, maybe it is a posture of envy and bitterness. You just cannot let it go comparing your life to other people and feeling aggressively angry about it. You know, maybe it's, it's just pride that leads you to being judgmental of others and looking down on them. Maybe it's just you're lazy and you can't stop taking advantage of others and you just keep falling back into that again and again and again. And maybe you've been struggling with this for years and years and years and you think, I cannot. There is going to be no change. There is no hope. Hear these words of comfort. See, the Lord Jesus knows what it is to resist, and he wants you to be like him, and he has given you his spirit and his word. You can make progress. You can make progress. I was reading this tweet. It was a tweet, which I haven't stuck on the screen. I'm going to read it to you. It's from one of my old Bible college lecturers. It was a couple of years ago, but I was really struck by this. Um, he was talking about New Year's resolutions, and he said this. Two New Year's resolutions about resolutions. I know we're in February, so this is very out of date. But he said this. Firstly, I will not fall into fantasy thinking there is a brand new me to be found in 2019. I am still me. But secondly... I will not fall into despair thinking that come December 2019, or for us, come December 2022, 
I'll still be the same old me. Progress is possible. God being my helper. Progress is possible. God is your helper. Let's depend on him and the work of his spirit. Let's bow our heads. And I'll just give you a few moments um, just to respond to the Lord about anything, anything that might have struck you, anything um, you want to, might want to bring before him. And then we're going to respond in um, song and praise, asking our great God of highest heaven to dwell within our hearts and to make us more like him. Just give you a few moments of quiet.